Uh, and it is really an interesting question. Uh, Nathan says this. He says, my wife wore a veil for the first time on Ash Wednesday. She has decided to practice this part of the liturgy throughout Lent. That is veiling as she goes to mm-hmm. church. Uh, however, we are converts, meaning to Lutheranism, right? Um, how do you practice veiling in a respectful way, especially in a church where no one else is veiling? Mm. So this is really, really fascinating um, to me. Uh, Pastor, do you support women choosing the veil? I'm going to say no. Um, you can. So I'm not going to say it's like, like, you better not. But in your scenario where nobody else does it, it's it's fascinating Like you're in the Lutheran church because you joined the Lutheran church and they might have forgotten this side of the other thing, but why would you come to this thing that you just found that you think it's amazing and change it? Like what's the difference between deciding we're going to veil even though no one else veils and deciding we're going to have a praise band even though nobody else does? In my mind, Adiaphora is the the topic. Formula of Concord, Article 10. You're a convert. You got your book of Concord, right? So Formula of Concord, Article 10. The thing's neither commanded nor forbidden. The key component in that entire article is whatever we change, let's do it together. So do I support veiling when no one else is doing it? No. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11 and I'm going to try to convince you that biblically there's no mandate on this thing. Now, are you free to veil? Yeah, absolutely. And does anybody care? Probably not. Okay. Um, But like they're going to think it's weird. Somebody will think it's weird. And as long as you're cool with that, like whatever, right? Um, how do you, I mean, it's, it's, it is strange in this culture. It really is. Um, if you were to be in a, a Middle Eastern culture, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe a little different. Meredith, do you veil? No. I don't. No. But personal story. What was it for the first six months of our marriage? Oh, true enough. I wore a handkerchief on my head to go to church. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not completely um, outside of that pious, Experience. yes, mm-hmm. desire to to follow the letter. Well, of the what letter. else happened at that same time? You remember? Mm, what are you referring well, to? What did my hair look look like when we got married? Oh, you had long hair. And then yes. And then he cut it. I well, cut it. Okay, so story. Well, you went to seminary. You were told at the interview, I thought, you had to cut your no, hair. I just found 1 Corinthians 11 in the Bible. Oh. I cut my hair and you started wearing a handkerchief. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah. I mean, I, I can see why someone would read it and come away with the impression that that's what should happen. The trick is you're not reading all of it. Um. He says, I know Lutherans have historically veiled question mark. I, I, no, I don't, I don't think we have. I think that many Western cultures, women have simply worn hats and or head coverings in public, um, but not always, again. Uh, and, uh, and so you say, what stopped the practice? Um, hats, moving from veils to hats and then hats to nothing. Um, strangely, I mean... Uh, Women are still allowed to wear hats in churches. Men aren't, right? So the practice hasn't quite stopped. But before I just try to deal with a historical thing, I'd rather take us to to the text. Um, Because I think it's really important that you see all of this text and not just the part where um, Paul is dealing with whatever was going on in Corinth that was specific. So 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 2 where he says, I praise you, brethren, you remember me in all the things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. That's actually a really important little little section right there. That he's he says they're not doing anything wrong. Okay, he's about to talk about this. He says they're not doing anything wrong, even though they're divided over it. Now, in a moment, you scroll down a little bit. Um, when he talks about the Lord's Supper, he says the opposite. Now, verse 17, he says... Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, for both or worse. So, so this whole section on head coverings is actually a, kind of a non-section. Like there's, there's not a problem unless you want to make a problem, all right? Whereas the Lord's Supper, y'all getting drunk, that's a problem. Okay, he's going to get real straight up on that. Okay, so first, you remember what I taught you, and this, this isn't one of those things, so it's not a big deal. But I want you to remember this, like this, don't forget, verse 3. 
The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Okay, this is classic headship teaching. Ephesians 5, Colossians 2. I think it's 2. Mm, it's Colossians. Um, are, are classic texts on this that go into a greater detail on the relationship between a husband and his wife. But here you have it made into a Trinitarian reality, right? So that the relationship of man to woman is connected to the relationship of Jesus to the Father. All right. So that's, that's pretty cool. And he's like, this, you need to know, you're not allowed to debate this. The Trinity and the relationship of man and woman are eternal orders. Okay. Um, or at least natural eternal orders. Well, the Trinity is eternal. Man and woman are natural. How man and woman work out in the resurrection is fascinating, but not, they won't be mushed. We just might not be married, won't be married. So anyway, um, so now then there's the part where it gets a little more interesting. Okay, so he just declares every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. Okay, so here's something he, he declares it um, as some kind of permanent reality, right? That to, to cover the man's head is to dishonor him. To uncover the woman's head is to dishonor her. Okay, so from here we're going to veil, right? Therefore, you got to wear a veil. Wait, he's not done yet. He's going to go into great detail to explain how long hair is a woman's covering. All right? So if you, if you have long hair... You don't need to veil. If you're going to shave your head like a butch lesbian, maybe it'd be better to cover it, he kind of says. Okay? Um, for, he actually says, I mean, I'm not making this up. For this, that one is the same as if her head were shaved. Okay? Uh, if a woman is not covered, let her hair be shorn. It is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved. Let her be covered. By the way, all these fours that are in here in this next, from verses six to seven, it's a very awkward Greek in here. Um, and so it is a section that I would declare to you to be confusing. What's his point? Um, a man ought indeed not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. A woman is the glory of man. That's his point. Man is the image and glory of God. A woman is the glory of man. So what he's getting to again is we need to distinguish man and woman from each other. That's the primary thing he's thrusting at here. That men shouldn't look like women. Women shouldn't look like men. How does that happen? He's going to get to the bottom. And he's going to tell you, well, you're going to have to figure that out. Like where you're at, it might be different than where somewhere else, someone else is, right? Um, before he gets to that, verses 8 through 11, he's just going to emphasize how man and woman are distinct from each other, how um, that doesn't make one better than the other, even though one is over the other, that they both come from each other continually now, and therefore we should not in any way lord it over each other, and that even the angels kind of care about a woman having a symbol of authority on her head that is not looking like a man. Okay, not looking like a man. But then again, keep reading. Judge for yourselves. Very important. You remember me in all things. You keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. My answer to this question is judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Judge for yourself. Does not even nature teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Well, wait a minute. How do we get to hair? Well, he's, he's pointing out, okay, well, if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. Her hair is given to her as a covering. That's the point. Like, so is it proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? Well, if she's got long hair, her head's covered. You don't have to cover it. Now, what about the man having short hair or long hair and being a dishonor to him? I'll come back to that in a second. But let's finish with the main point. Well, not the main point. Main point is man and woman are different. Second main point is if anyone wants to have a contention about this, we have no customs about it, nor does any church of God. Right? So there's no law here. There's no rule here. There's no universal prohibition or commandment here. You need to judge for yourselves. How do you, as a group, make women and men appear different to each other? And now what you're doing specifically is you're going into a group and you're saying, this is how we're going to do it. But no one else in the group's doing it. So how is that going to help the group learn to distinguish? That, that's the thing. And if the answer is, well, the Bible says you have to, see, that's not going to help. Because now you're making a law where there's no law. So do I support it? I don't care if someone wanted to come to St. Paul and veil because they think they need to. I Actually, honestly, in my heart, I'd be like, that's sad. They're legalists. They think that's the only way to do it. Whereas right now, the war is pretty big. Like the war against man and woman is pretty big and we're not going to solve it by being like legalism. 
right? It's not going to do it. What we have to do is embrace. I'm a man. You're a woman. Let's let's like be different. And honestly, the hairstyle has everything to do with it right now. Why? Why am I doing this? How many women do this? They don't. Maybe a butch again, trying to be man because men do this with beards. Why? Because it, it actually isn't being imitated by women. You know what's imitated by women? Short hair. A lot, a lot of women with short hair. It looks like men's hair and they're women and you can't tell the difference, right? So this is actually trying to embrace something that looks masculine. Now, maybe it isn't. And some guys are like, it doesn't look masculine. Okay, well, fine. Just for yourself. Don't be contentious about it. Look masculine. Women, look feminine. If you want to wear a veil, fine. You want to wear a nice big bonnet? Do it, you know? Men, don't wear nice big bonnets. Well, it's not going to work, right? Um, we're not supposed to create a custom that is belonging to the whole church of God. We are to judge for ourselves how we can put forward to make it clear that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Yeah? So, um, I will also say, I'll pull it down. I mean, there are girls who shave shave the size of their heads, right? There, there are girls who do this. Um, it's not really a feminine look. Right? And so, you know, the barbarian long hair um, is not quite what he's getting at here as opposed to the glory of woman's hair. Like they're going to spend all this time doing stuff to their hair, making it look beautiful. How? There are guys who do that these days. That's that's what he's saying don't do, right? Look like a man, look like a woman. Um, and how long does your, in, in your culture, which styles say which? And in our culture, none of the styles say anything except for that a few kind of say things more or less. Um, but again, you, you're going to find men wearing women's hairstyles now. You're going to find women wearing men's hairstyles now. And so what you want to do is try to embrace things that clearly distinguish you as you where you are, which is going to have things to do with now clothing is going to be a part of this. You know, what are you, what are you wearing? Um, how you carry yourself, how you talk, right? You know, do you, do you talk with a lisp, you know? Uh, it, and again, it's a caricature, but it's also real, right? So the entire section is about preserving the order of creation. And if you're just going to say, well, therefore we have to wear veils in my mind, like you're not going to, you're, you're not going to convince anybody. You're, you're picking the fight where the fight isn't. And those who might be with you are just going to think you're weird or legalistic. What you want to do is join with those who are with you and make it clear who you are. Right. And not be, not don't burden your conscience with rules that don't really exist. Um, so, but I mean, if at the end of the day you love veils and you think veils are beautiful and this is a great way to just be beautiful, like do it, right? but, but don't do it. Cause you think you have to, um, judge for yourselves yeah. and you can judge for yourself. Uh, that's kind of the point. Mm -hmm.